Um, so as I said, welcome to our eighth lecture of our Bite Size Animal Loss series. Um, and sadly, our last. Um, it's been really great to have you all here with us, joining us every Wednesday. Um, and for those of you who are just joining us this evening, I just want to let you know that if you've missed some, they will be on YouTube after the series is over. Um, and I want to thank as well um, all of the speakers who gave up their Wednesdays to prep um, and be with us to present on these really important topics. And just before I introduce our speaker for this evening, I just want to let you all know how to participate in the Q&A. Um, I know some of you are already well aware of this, but for those of you who are new for this evening, um, in order to participate in the Q&A, you'll see at the bottom of your screen a little Q&A icon. So if you do want to ask a question, um, just pop your question into the Q&A. And if you do want to remain anonymous, please just select Submit Anonymously. Um, and then, of course, there's also um, the ability to vote up people's questions. If you do see a question you would like to have answered, um, you can just select um, the questions you want to vote up. Um, okay, so it is, um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Paula this evening. Um, I've been working very closely with Paula for the last year, um, and it's been really great. So um, for those of you who don't know who Paula is, Paula is the chairperson of the UK Centre for Animal Law. Um, and previously she was in practice as a barrister at Doty Street Chambers. Um, Paula has an interest in animal law and she regularly lectures and writes on topics um, around animal law and policy. She's currently a visiting lecturer at the University of Winchester where she teaches animal law and policy. And she also has experience in the voluntary sector, which is where she worked prior to starting her independent practice as a barrister. So if you could all join me in a warm, silent welcome to Paula. <laughs> I'll hand it over to you, Paula. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tiffany. And uh, thank you for hosting this series so beautifully. It's been a really good um good eight weeks and it's been, been brilliant having you and it, it's also lovely working with you as well so thank you and for you and for all our visitors in canada happy canada day today <laughs> fantastic okay everyone well i've got some slides i'll be sharing with you um i firstly just wanted to say um that as i realized as i was preparing this talk which was going to cover uh, everything around farm animal welfare, but actually, you know, to actually do the topic justice, I've really had to narrow right down to on farm welfare. So we haven't really had time to, um, in this session, which is a bite-sized session, to concentrate on transport and slaughter. So we might have some questions about that, but for tonight, I'm just going to, to take you through some of the, the on-farm stuff. So I'm just going to share my screen with you now. Let me get some slides. And here's the first question that Tiffany's going to be asking. Excellent. Thank you, Paula. There we go. Okay, so the first question is going to be, what factors have influenced the development of farmed animal welfare in the UK? Okay, thank you. Right. I think the starting point has to be Animal Machines, a book written by Ruth Harrison in 19, published in 1964. It was a groundbreaking book and extremely influential, um, really focusing in on the needs and the welfare of animals in the intensive farming systems that had been developing in the years before. And that book stimulated really the government to um, appoint the Bramble Committee. Um, so it's chaired by Professor Bramble and the subsequent report was a very uh, full report about the welfare of animals farmed in intensive husbandry systems. And um, novel for its day, in fact, um, Bramble really explored issues around welfare. So that's the physical and the man mental well-being of animals within the agricultural system. And that included looking at factors such as the animal's environment, their exposure to hazards, diseases, 
their diet, what opportunities they had to socialize and for companionship, the temperature and lighting of the housing that they were kept in, and their ability to express natural behaviors, as well as focusing on the mutilations that were prevalent in the farming system then, as you know, many of them we know are, are, are now. And I say it's a fairly novel approach because the legislative regi regime at the time was really one of anti-cruelty provisions. So this concept of looking at welfare was, was new for its day. And one of the um, comments made in the report is that an animal should at least have sufficient freedom of movement to be able without difficulty to turn around, to groom itself, get up, lie down and stretch its limbs. Um, those five freedoms became referred to as Bramble's five freedoms. And the report also recommended statutory minimum welfare requirements for certain animals in the farming system, so poultry, pigs, cattle, calves, and turkey. And it recommended prohibiting certain mutilating practices such as um, debeaking and tail docking, as well as tethering for calves and cattle on the basis that it wasn't uh, commensurate with good welfare. Uh, so the impact of Bramble was extremely significant. Its recommendations influenced legislation and led to codes of recommendations being set up for the welfare of a number of farmed animal species. Uh, the report also recommended the establishment of the Farm Animal Welfare Advisory Committee as a scientific body to advise ministers about farm animal welfare um, and indeed that was set up. So looking at um, what uh, the legislative reforms were, so we remind ourselves that at the time of the Bramble report, the legislative framework was really um, under the Protection of Animals Act 1911 and they can, that, that act contained anti-cruelty provisions but there was no welfare duty. So we didn't actually see a proper welfare duty introduced until the 2006 Animal Welfare Act uh, and the equivalents in the devolved administrations. And Bramble pointed to the fact that little protection was offered by this legislation to farm, farmed animals. And in part, that was to do with the inadequacy of definitions in relation to farming practices. There's just this um, there's not the specificity that's required by the legislation to offer a comprehensive protection. So the first legislative change after Bramble uh, came the Agricultural Miscellaneous Provisions Act of 1968 and this made it an offence specifically to cause or permit livestock on agricultural land to suffer unnecessary pain or unnecessary distress. Importantly, it also granted powers of entry to premises to check on animal welfare, and it enabled the relevant minister to publish codes of recommendations and secondary legislation for animal welfare. Uh, the advisory committee was indeed established. So in 1968, it was set up, and in 1979, it was renamed and became the Farm Animal Welfare Council. Unfortunately, as it uh, was constituted, it was disbanded in 2011. I think uh, Steve McCulloch referred to this in his, his earlier discussion, uh, that it became a victim of what became known as the bonfire of the Quangos, when a number of these non-departmental public bodies were disbanded. Uh, it was felt that there'd been too much of a proliferation of them. Um, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't gone completely. It was replaced with the Farm Animal Welfare Committee. The difference being that this is no longer a non-departmental public body, but sits within DEFRA. So there's a certain loss of independence with it coming within the ministerial department, although the members are independent and are tasked to give independent advice to the uh, DEFRA, to DEFRA, to their department. 
Um, the uh, fork has been renamed very recently to the Animal Welfare Committee and that really reflects an expanded remit that has been afforded it to look into um, also issues around companion animals and wild animals under the care of people. So Tiffany. Sorry, I have myself muted. <laughs> what have been the key recommendations of um, FARC? Okay, I think the most important has been the um, development of the five freedoms. So taking that concept that really came from the Bramble Report and developing it. And so I know many of you will be very familiar with the five freedoms. They are freedoms from and they are matched by a means of addressing those freedoms. So taking as an example, freedom from thirst, hunger and malnutrition is addressed by ensuring that animals have access to a diet to maintain full health and vigour. So you can see those on the slide um, and the accompanying statement. Now, um, they had the five freedoms as a concept have no legal status, but they have been adopted worldwide as a benchmark for animal welfare evaluation. And they do provide a framework for promoting good welfare. They define ideal standards rather than acceptable standards in the sense that no one, humans included, will ever be completely free from, say, hunger, because there's a way um, that you'll, you'll be hungry and then you'll satisfy your need there are always going to be needs you have that you are working towards to satisfy. It's part of life, we go to work, we get some pleasure from going to work, most of us, um, and we're, we're on a journey. Um, but so they're ideal standards in that respect. Another very important report, I think, um, that came from, um, the, from Fork, was the review of Bramble, it should say it's a Bramble report, it's actually the Fork report, but was reviewing Bramble in 2009. And this was an important report, I think, for a number of reasons. The, the first um, point to note about this report is reviewing Bramble. Uh, Fork found that, you know, undoubtedly the Bramble report had had a positive effect on welfare. It, not just in, in Great Britain, but abroad. So its impact was significant. However, it also acknowledged that implementation of some of the recommendations had taken many years, and for others, they were still incomplete. And primarily, that was for economic reasons. So it wasn't because the science wasn't there. It was because of the cost of implement implementing some of those measures. So that was, that was an important statement. And the report also noted um, insufficient progress in, res in, re in resolving welfare problems such as lameness in dairy cows, uh, problems around broiler chickens, continued mutilations, and behavioral restrictions in some areas. And they cited issues such as poor profits in the um, farming sector, foreign competition, which have caused a loss of confidence to invest in better animal welfare and an absence of proper welfare labelling, preventing consumers from making informed choices about their food sources. Again, also, I thought that this, this is a really good concept that was developed um, by um, Fork, and that refers to a life worth living. And so you can see from this, this um, quote here, Fork argues that as a minimum, each farm animal should have a life worth living from the animal's perspective. Any farm animal that does not have a life worth living would be literally better off dead. So it's moving on from the five freedoms and looking at how can we develop this to ensure that um, animals' needs are appropriately met within the farming system. Um, and you know, this concept I thought was, or I think is, is a good one. Um, and assessing a life worth living 
also means looking at an animal's mental as well as their physiological needs and it involves an assessment of their quality of life over the animal's lifetime including its death and the suffering that it will undergo at death so it involves assessing both positive and negative states over the course of the animal's lifetime now it wasn't a light bulb moment for the government it hasn't resulted as far as i can see in any significant shift in policy but it seems to me it would be a good way forward to move on from the five freedoms and to take that further unfortunately it's just a concept that um, i don't think has uh, been uh, particularly uh, developed so far as uh, it's influenced farm animal policy I have um, put up here on the slides two of the recent reports from FORC. So in 2019, there was a report on um, animal sentience and another on the welfare of cattle kept for beef production. There are too many to mention um, in this presentation, but I have also put the link up to the reports for anyone who just wants to browse those. So Tiffany. What is the legislative framework for the well-being of farmed animals? Okay. So we have the Animal Welfare Act in England and Wales and the equivalent Animal Welfare Act in the devolved administrations. These uh, place a, create a general welfare duty protecting vertebrate animals, don't forget, and prohibiting unnecessary pain and suffering. So that's a very, very general duty. It lacks the specificity that we were talking about earlier. So a, a lot of uh, the current law comes from Europe. Uh, now the Council of Europe isn't part of the EU, but um, the conventions of the Council of Europe are usually adopted by the EU. And we have three that are relevant to um, animals in farming, so the international transport, animals kept for farming purposes, and the Convention on Slaughter, which I've set out here. And the 1976 Convention, which applies to all animals kept for the production of food, wool, skin, fur, or other farming purposes, was approved by an EU decision, um, and a standing committee was established to develop more detailed regulations and that's give, been given effect to in the EU by this Council Directive 9858. Um, one thing that it's interesting to just note um, and good to look for reports is that EU legislation is appropriately informed by um, scientific input and that is via the scientific panel on animal health and welfare of the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA. And EFSA advises the European Commission before new EU legislation is drafted. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the scientific recommendations are always followed. And sometimes um, EFSA, the EFSA panel has uh, made recommendations that haven't found their way into the subsequent legislation. And that's often for reasons um, related to pragmatism or economics, where the Commission has not been able to support that. So going back to the General Farm Animals Directive, this is the directive of uh, 9858. This is a directive from the EU that extends to um, animals, including fish, uh, kept for the purposes you can see on the uh, slide. And it requires member states to make provisions to ensure that the owners and keepers take reasonable steps to ensure the welfare of animals under their care. So that's, that's why we refer to it as a general farm animal directive. The provisions relate to um, all the species that are farmed in this way. And it's supplemented by various species specific directives. So there are council directives relating to the laying pens, calves, pigs, and chickens kept for meat, 
and I've um, just shared the references with you um, there. Now the Directive 9858 has been transposed into domestic law through the Welfare of Farmed Animal England regulations of 2007 and the equivalent regulations in the devolved administrations which I've also put up on your screens. Um, these regulations made under the power of the Animal Welfare Act in the relevant jurisdiction, their general conditions applicable to farmed animals, they exclude from their scope fish, reptiles, amphibians, laboratory animals, animals living in the wild and those used for competition and cultural sporting activities. Um, and they do place a duty on people attending animals to be acquainted with relevant codes of practice, to have access to those codes of practice and attending the animals. Um, there are duties of training and ensuring that access of codes are extended to employees and they're set out in the sections that you can see here. And the structure of the regulations is that there is then uh, Schedule 1, which contains general provisions relating to staffing, inspection, record keeping, accommodation, feeding, watering, breeding conditions. So these are more detailed, specific provisions that are set out in Schedule 1. And then in Schedules 2 to 9, we have species-specific provisions relating to not all species, but laying hens, calves, cattle, pigs, and rabbits. And I've put up the uh, relevant schedules for you there. Okay, uh, there was also an amendment regulation in 2010, and that extends those provisions to conventionally reared meat chickens. And there's an additional schedule relating to those meat chickens. And so that's what that, that relates to. Um, there is also the mutilations permitted procedures England regulations of 2007 which set out in uh, schedule one the permitted procedures for mutilations. Now this was required because the Animal Welfare Act prohibits mutilations which are referred to as prohibited procedures and they're defined in the Animal Welfare Act as ones which involve interference with the sensitive tissues or bone structure of the animal otherwise than for the purpose of its medical treatment. So this regulation was necessary to legalise what would otherwise have been illegal potentially under the Animal Welfare Act. And so it sets out what procedures are prohibited and what procedures uh, can be carried out in effect. There are also a number of codes of recommendation or codes of practice um, which do not have legal status in the UK, but they may be of evidential value to a court when uh, looking at whether um, there has been a breach of the regulations. So what I'm going to do now is just spend a little bit of time just looking at some of the species specific regulations and some of the controversial areas around the keeping of those animals that are subject to those regulations. Um, so I'm going to start with pigs and I've taken some information here from Viva. Thank you to Viva for putting this helpful information on their website. But that estimates, I think that 1% of pigs spend their whole life outdoors um, and they, most of them are moved to indoor units after weaning. Um, so even if it's not 1%, it seems to be a very high percentage. Uh, the lifespan for a pig, as I understand, is about 10, and a half, 10 plus years. It can be much longer, but they're killed at around five years of age for meat or around, uh, sorry, five years of age, or if it's for, for meat, around six months. So there's a big disparity there. But these are intelligent, social animals, and they can develop a quite stereotypic behaviours uh, in the intensive farming system. Now, um, one thing I will just, just say is interject here, there is a really good article in our forthcoming Animal Justice UK um, uh, magazine. I'll, I'll, hand it, I'll, I'll show you it here. This is, this is my copy of it. It hasn't been published yet uh, because we're just going through the final proofing, but I've had the advantage of reading it and a really good article by Hannah Battersby. I wonder if you might be out there, Hannah, I know you've been joining in some of these lectures. 
uh, but I had a PhD student um, in um, uh, the University of Manchester and has raised this really interesting issue around the ethics of animals having shortened lifespans and the relevance of that for welfare which is often an overlooked issue when we're talking about welfare um, so it's really interesting to read that and the other great articles in there including by um, our very own Tiffany so we've got that to look forward to as well really really good article um, um, in, in that uh, publication and it's a special edition on farmed animals um, this edition uh, and thank you to Natalie for putting it together so beautifully as she always does. Um, okay so just moving on, uh, that's one of the areas that's been quite controversial has been around sow stalls um, and uh, farrowing crates. So the pigs directive as we'll call it, it's council directive 2008 120 which replaces earlier directives um, prohibits um, tether stalls where a sow is tethered within the stall, but it, um, it, it does allow a certain use of sow stalls. Now sow stalls are narrow cages surrounding a sow during pregnancy uh, and they're now to be phased out over 12 years since 2001 uh, except for four weeks of pregnancy. So you know, you know pregnancy starts with inseminations, artificial insemination, and to last one week before the expected time of birth. Um, and uh, the four week exception um, has been a subject of criticism, I believe, by EFSA's scientific panel uh, because of the restriction of freedom on the cell. Um, so it, it's an, an area that's not free from controversy. Barrowing crates so essentially the same type of crate but it's actually used at a different time so it's used um, after the birth of the piglets and burrowing crates in the uh, farmed animal welfare regulations of England should have stricter provisions than in the EU so these are uh, permitted after birth until piglets have been weaned uh, ostensibly to prevent injuries to the piglets uh, so the pros, just to be fair, well, I've set out here um, some information from the National Pig Association. They say, look, this is necessary to create pigs to prevent injury to piglets and stop persons who are in close proximity to the sow at this time. And they're opposed to a unilateral ban. Some of the factors that they um, have given um, for opposing a unilateral ban, the fact there's no market pool for them, there's no government finance for alternative systems, there's a backdrop of difficult trading conditions um, and there is a link on the website here to uh, uh, why they support that. Um, on the other hand, from Beaver's website again, um, it said that these frustrate maternal and nesting instincts and cells can be kept in them for long periods given the fact that cells are usually impregnated within a week of giving birth and they spend about four weeks, four months pregnant and then they can be in a farrowing crate so for about 20 to 35 days of every month and it limits their ability to express natural behaviors so again have a look at their fact sheet and really I, I actually this week as well watched their Hog, Hogwood docu-film which is a really good film I thought about the um, pigs and the conditions of pigs in intensive farming systems um, and if you watch that and then look back to and keep in mind the five freedoms and the life worth living um, it, it's an interesting contrast. Pig mutilations are also another controversial area. Um, so routine towel docking and teeth clipping or grinding um, shouldn't be permitted now uh, without first trying to address the environmental factors that may lead to these undesirable behaviors that might require docking or teeth clipping. Um, Compassionate World Farming, again, I know Ted's taking this back from 2014, but I think uh, relevant points today suggest there's some core poor compliance with the uh, requirements around enrichment materials. So there hasn't been as much progress 
in um, addressing um, the uh, concerns around tower docking and deep clipping. Surgical castration is another area of concern. Um, as far as I understand it, and I'm not a scientist or a pig farmer, but this is practiced more um, outside of the UK and other European countries, but castration is permitted without anesthetic up to seven days of age. Um, now, it's recognized that this does inflict pain, and in fact, there is a voluntary agreement now to phase out um, prolonged and uh, castration without prolonged anesthesia um, and for castration of pigs, which should be abandoned by, should have been abandoned by January 2018. So I can't tell you how prevalent it is now, but uh, that was certainly the um, intention. Uh, dairy, uh, cows used for the dairy industry. Uh, there's no EU species specific legislation. The Welfare of Farmed Animals England regulation does have a code of recommendation for cattle. Uh, it is required that dairy cows and calving cows should be kept in a building to have access to well-drained and bedded lying area. Calves should be um, kept separate from livestock other than calving cows and pens should be of a size to permit a person to attend the pens. Some of the welfare concerns that have been raised by animal advocacy groups include zero grazing farming systems where cows are housed indoors for most or a large part of the year. There have been um, concerns about foot and leg disorders, mastitis and other health problems. There's also concern about the mental distress due to separation taken uh, when, the, when the mother's taken from the calf which would normally suckle for up to a year but is taken away quite soon after birth and in fact this was something that was acknowledged in the Bramble report and they referred to the distress of the calf and the mother at this time that said look unfortunately we don't see any way around it it's, it's inherent in the system so um, you know they didn't feel that there were any recommendations they could make around that uh, another concern uh, is about male calves being shot or transported on long journeys for the meat industry. I know that uh, Compassion and World Farming and RSPCA have been working with the industry to try and reduce the numbers of male calves that are shot um, after birth. Um, and I think the number is still go is, is going down, but a significant number are still um, killed in this way. Another concern is genetic selection of cows for their high milk yield and that causing problems uh, for the welfare of dairy calves. There is um, a calves directive uh, that prohibits tethering of calves um, except in these certain circumstances. There are minimum space and accommodation requires that requirements that are set out a prohibition against keeping calves in total darkness. Um, and there's some difference between the uh, English regulations, which require calves to be provided with bedding at all time, and the EU, EU regulations, which only require bedding to be provided for the first two weeks of the calf's life. So slightly more protection there. Uh, the the calf's directive, directive also um, addresses issues around diet. So, um, that there, there was a significant problem around the time of Bramble with calves being given this low roughage, low iron diet, which produced this very white veal meat uh, that was scientifically not good for their uh, welfare. Uh, and so there are provisions now that have prevent uh, that practice. Laying hens, um, so we have a ban on battery cages, which would be very um, uh, restricted, uh, restricted cages uh, from 2012. There are now enriched cages, uh, but the stocking densities are still quite high. You can see them here. There is a requirement for hens to have a nest and perching area, litter for per pecking and scratching, access to feed, uh, feed trough and a period of darkness. So these, these are hens that are kept 
indoors that, that for indoor house pens so it's important that they're just not exposed to artificial light 24 7 and so there is provision in there for them to have um, a dark period when they can sleep so what are the problems with enriched cages apart from the fact they are cages uh, hens will never see the natural light of their house for their lifetime indoors and I've put a link up here to Compassion in World Farming's report about enriched cages saying look they may be legal but they aren't right the opportunities for perching and scratching they're too meagre and the space is still too small for the expression of natural behaviours uh, beak trimming um, so I've put something up about here um, and the, uh, that this is permitted uh, only up until the age of 10 days. Uh, chickens reared for meat are referred to as broilers and again there are maximum stock, stocking densities uh, for broilers and those stocking densities can be increased if certain conditions including lower mortality rates good management practices are met but then you then have um, more um, chicken in a smaller space so not not great um, so there are specific provisions in the directive relating to drinkers access to litter ventilation uh, requirements around training and there's a prohibition upon beak trimming um, um, except when it's needed to prevent some of these uh, stereotypic behaviors that may be uh, may be seen so i just wanted to just step back and just so look that's what the legislation says but let's have a look at one of the cases around this which is yeah it goes back to 2004 um, but there's very little case law in this area um, and I thought this actually gives some um, insight into uh, the issues around uh, these chickens kept in the intensive systems so this was a case that was brought by Compassion in Wild Farming it was a case that was pursued against the Secretary of State and it related to um, the broiler, breeding broiler breeds that were subject to selective breeding so that they reached their target weight quicker than they would otherwise. And this rendered them vulnerable to serious ailments such as leg, heart and lungs not developing quickly enough to support the massive muscle growth that accompanies this weight gain. To address that, birds are subjected to a severely restricted feeding regime and the diet was restricted to around 20 to 50 percent of what broilers would normally consume for the first 20 weeks. So that led to a welfare problem, arguably of chronic hunger. If the diet wasn't restricted, then additional weight gain would cause welfare problems with the heart, potential lameness, egg production and poor hatchability. So there are balancing considerations. Now the council directive, this is the general directive that we, we saw earlier, requires animals to be fed a diet appropriate to their age and species in sufficient quantity to maintain good health and satisfy their nutritional needs. It requires animals to have access to feeds at appropriate intervals. And it requires that animals should be kept for farming purposes um, unless they cannot on the basis of their genotype be kept without having a detrimental effect on their health and welfare and that directive as we've seen has been transposed into the UK law by the regulations so leads to the natural question well, how can this restricted feeding regime of these um, uh, genetically selected uh, broilers be legal. Unfortunately, um, the Compassion in World Farming were not successful in the case. The court at first instance said it can't be shown that the birds were starving. It's not enough to show that the feed resulted in them being chronically hungry or very hungry because hunger is a natural physiological state. Intensive farming and protection of chickens is not in itself unlawful and the need to achieve a balance in relation to the health of the broiler 
uh, was an intended aspect of intensive farming systems. When this uh, went to the Court of Appeal, what they said was, uh, provided broilers are provided with a diet that's wholesome and appropriate to their age and species, and that was found at first instance, there could be no contravention of the regulations if just for part of their lives they were chronically hungry. You have to have a balance to be arrived at the competing welfare considerations of hunger versus the ailments that they would get if they put on their weight too early. And they wouldn't go beyond that possibility uh, considering that these fast growing genotypes should not be permitted by the legislation. So um, unfortunately, that was the outcome and that's still the situation. Now, there's a number of species I haven't mentioned. Fish, intensive aquaculture, I know is a huge issue and lots more than, you know, growth in intensive aquaculture and farmed fish. Rabbits, there have been um, concerns around cage rabbits and a number of activity going on around that, which I've put a few links to. Octopus, really, I can't think of a species myself that um, would be uh, less uh, suited to intensive um, farming regimes, um, unfortunately, um, but there are proposals around octopus farms you have to watch out for. And um, one thing I just want to end with before I move on to just talking about Brexit very briefly is what's the role of law here? What, what role does legislation play? And as preparing for the talk today, I went back to Mike Bradford's book and as wise as ever, Mike, um, he says two things when commenting on the battery cages as were legal at that time. And he says at worst, the law can be used to sanction systems which are intrinsically antagonistic to achieving a high standard of welfare. And he went on to say, when discussing the battery cages, while legislation has a significant role to play in positively improving the position of animals, which it does, its effect can also be to endorse and entrench standards which public policymakers may consider to be acceptable which are incompatible with the promotion of a high standard of welfare for the animals concerned. He says it therefore demonstrates the continuing need to campaign to improve the legal standards which apply to domestic and captive animals, which is that, that, that's so true. But law isn't, it, the regulations in this area are not there to provide any gold standard for animal welfare they relate to a certain extent to a compromise that public policy makers have felt to be acceptable between commercial considerations and welfare considerations. And sometimes those welfare considerations we feel don't, don't, aren't given the prominence that they should have. And I think that Mike Mike's comment there as well about the need to continuing campaigning to improve legal standards is also so true and I think we can see that with the cages initiative as well. Uh, this campaign to end the cage age for farmed animals and the number of really high number over a million I think something near, near to a million and a half signatures to the petition uh, to the EC asking them to prohibit cages for laying hens, rabbits, pullets, other breeds, farrowing crates um, for sows, sow stalls where not already prohibited, and individual calf pens where not already prohibited. We know they're, all, they're already limited. Uh, but as people going back to those five freedoms, going back to a life worth living, and saying, well, thinking about the animal's welfare needs, how can being in a cage for all of your, that animal's lifetime be commensurate to having those welfare needs being met? So that's all I want to say on this. Um, so we're on to our final section, you'll be pleased to hear. <laughs> Thank you, Paula. So what is the likely impact of Brexit on farmed animal welfare? Thank you, Tiffany. Um, okay, I'm gonna run through this really quickly because I know we've already gone over our 20 to 30 minutes and we're not gonna have much time for questioning. Um, so as, you, as you've seen, most of the UK legislation on farmed animal welfare has been derived from the EU. And the EU law shaped and is shaped by the UK 
we've seen these directives on minimum standards for animal husbandry and there are also regulations on welfare for transport and slaughter. Um, now, um, AO is very pleased, along with the Wildlife and Countryside Link, to coordinate this report, which had over 40 signatories from animal groups, sector by sector analysis, including agriculture, setting out key welfare recommendations, looking at both the threats and the opportunities for animals um, arising from Brexit. So we didn't draft uh, the content, we were happy to help coordinate, but the content came from those groups looking at one of the biggest asks going forward. The section on agriculture I've given you the link to here, it's in section four of the report. The reports um, can be downloaded from our website, uh, you can read it in your leisure. Um, but the farming recommendations, no surprise, ban on live exports for slaughter, introducing strong welfare incentives in British farming, uh, labelling laws, the, uh, a ban on the import of foie gras, working with UK fisheries to promote humane catches, uh, and ask for legal protection for crabs, lobsters, octopus, squids, other invertebrates. So they were the recommendations from the report. Uh, the report identified key areas for reform, trade and post cap payments, so what, what the new system is for agricultural subsidies going forward. Trade recommendations, um, looking at um, animal welfare standards uh, that sh should be met uh, before we can um, import. Domestic and imported goods labelled as to method of production, foie gras comes up again ban on live export of animals for slaughter coming up again. Agricultural subsidies, um, looking at new farm support systems that reward better animal welfare and environmental standards that may be bringing pigs to slaughter without them tail docking. So if you're going over and above the legislative minimum, there may be ways of encouraging that other than through legislation, but through farm payments. Uh, species specific and other recommendations, um, extending protections to decapod crustaceans and cephalopods, phasing out zero grazing, increasing maximum permitted stocking densities uh, for broiler chickens, shifting away from these fast growing bird genotypes because of the issues around welfare, banning the use of enriched cages for laying hens, um, replacing burrowing crates with free systems. A uh, requirement for detailed species specific recommendations for a broader range of species, a ban on preventing the use of antibiotics, mandatory use of CCTV in slaughterhouses, we now have, phasing out high concentrations of carbon dioxide for uh, stunning and killing pigs, and shackling chickens for water bath, stunning and mandatory stunning before slaughter. Oh, I got through that very quick, <laughs> quicker that section, quicker than I thought. So I will come out of screen share and join you again. Okay, so thank you Tiffany. Sorry, I know I've gone over time. We only have a few minutes really left, but if there are any burning questions, I'll be happy to do my best to answer them. Thank you, Paula, very, very much for your presentation. It's always so sad to see um, the cages and mm. Different, um, issues from the animals living in cages. But Paula, thank you so, so much for your presentation. Um, you know, there's so much to learn about farming. And um, as you mentioned, you were only able to touch on so much of it. So perhaps we'll have to do another webinar. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for preparing and presenting with us this evening. I'm sure I can speak on behalf of everybody. Um, it was very informative. And to everybody attending, thank you so much for being with us since I think we started May, early May, May 3rd, maybe. Um, so it's gone by very fast. Thank you so much for being with us every week. And for those of you, as I've said earlier, who have missed any of the series, um, it will be on the on our YouTube. I just see someone's written May 6th. They know better than I do. <laughs> thank you. Um, and again, to any of the speakers who are attending this evening, thank you so much for giving your time as well um, to prepare your presentations and present to us and to take questions from the audience. Um, we've received really great feedback from everybody. So again, thank you very much. 
And thank you again, Tiffany, for being such a fantastic host. And we, we do have this Journal of Animal Law, just giving a final plug. Um, so if you're not a member already and you want to keep up to date with animal law, please do, um, do join and receive the newsletter. You can also sign up for our university focused Animal Justice UK, which is a free publication. Uh, more university focused and that has contributions from students as well as campaign groups and others so you know please get involved get in touch with us share your thoughts if you want us to talk at a university you're at you know please you know do stay in touch with us and thank you again Tiffany you've been great Thank you, Paula. And further to what Paula's just said, um, if we do have any students or, or non-students, it doesn't have to be a student who would like to get involved, um, volunteer or write for us, I've just popped um, our student group email into the chat, studentgroup at alaw.org.uk, um, and I'll then filter them out. Um, if you are, um, if you're non-students or, you know, you can still get involved and volunteer with us. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And Hopefully we'll see you soon for another webinar or series. <laughs> Thank you all. Take care. Bye. Bye.